Thank you, and uh, I appreciate that it's uh, pretty late in the evening. Hopefully, this will be a short talk. I don't think I should need more than half an hour, uh, and it should be uh, fairly light as well. Okay, good. So. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about broadcast over random graphs, and this is uh, joint work with my PhD student, Mark Graham, and he's being co-supervised by me and my colleague, Rob Behotsky in engineering. Uh, okay, so the motivation for the problem we are looking at, loosely speaking, comes from driverless cars. You might think of other possible motivations. Uh, so the idea is you have, um, a number of cars which need to exchange small amounts of information, but they need to do this quickly and reliably, but they are communicating over a channel which is not that reliable. Uh, so, when a, uh, and it's a broadcast channel. So each car broadcasts its position and velocity and some random subset of other cars hears them and the rest don't, but everybody has to get the message. Okay, so the way we model this, we have n agents or nodes in a graph, and each has one packet to send, and everybody has to receive everybody else's packets with high probability, not with certainty. And they communicate over broadcast channels. Uh, we assume a lot of homogeneity. Maybe this is not reasonable, but this is our assumption. So there's one probability p, so that if I transmits, everybody else hears this with the same probability P, and this is the same for all pairs of nodes. Um, time is going to be discrete, and we'll assume that one time slot is long enough for every agent to broadcast one packet simultaneously and for everybody to receive, hear everybody else. So how exactly you realize this as an engineering issue is up to you. You might, maybe you have n orthogonal channels and they transmit simultaneously or you just have one channel but you slot it over time and you, you, you divide things over time. Uh, how you do that is up to you, but this is the abstraction. Okay, so there are different ways. So you could think of uh, what happens over time. Okay, the other assumption is that it's an erasure channel. So if I send a packet, either you receive it or you don't receive it. We don't consider the possibility that you receive it with some errors and we are trying to correct them. The whole packet is erased. Uh, and you could realize these erasures in one of two ways. Uh, so in each time slot, you could resample which uh, links are going to be erased. And that's called fast fading. Uh, in, um, in wireless networks, or if you are thinking of this in, in the language of statistical physics, you'd call this an annealed model, the random, you're averaging over the randomness. Uh, or you pick up these uh, erasure random variables, you sample them once, and you keep the same sampling uh, forever after that, and that's the quench setting or the slow fading setting. Uh, and uh, in this talk, we are going to look at the quench setting. It seems harder. We can't prove it's harder. It seems the harder case to deal with. But also, it's well motivated by applications because we are thinking of time scales of you, you want to finish this communication in the order of seconds or tens of seconds. So within that time, it's reasonable to assume that the fading stays constant. OK, and then. With our assumptions, that means we have a random graph GNP. Uh, okay, again, the scaling regime we are going to consider is P fixed and N going to infinity. You could question this, and one of the open problems would be to extend it beyond that. Uh, again, from our motivation, N is not huge. It's going to be of the order of a few tens to several tens, probably. Uh, and within that scale, it seemed reasonable to think of P as fixed. Uh, and so that's the problem we are going to look at. And we want to find some simple way uh, for all the uh, uh, packets to reach all the nodes. So, okay, so the model is clear, the problem statement. There are a couple of very natural algorithms. The first thing you would think of uh, is relaying. So. Uh, if I transmit, not everybody hears me, so I need somebody else to relay my message uh, until everybody gets it. 
Now, you could have a centralized controller who knows the realization of the graph and tells people which messages they should relay. That's, and you can solve it that way, but we want to do it in a fully decentralized way. Uh, and that makes it natural to just consider random relay. So what happens? So in the first time slot, everybody sends their own packet. Some random subset of others receives them. And in subsequent time slots, they will pick ran a packet randomly to relay. There are two kinds of things they could do. You could just pick uniformly from packets you received in the first time slot and keep doing that over successive time slots. Or in time slots three, four, and five, you could pick randomly from everything you have accumulated up to that time. The second version seems more natural. The first version is easier to analyze. We are going to look at both of them. We get better bounds for the first version, but these are two versions of this algorithm. Uh, and then later we look at another algorithm which uses coding, but relaying is the first thing we look at. Okay. Uh, and you might have guessed how many rounds you would need for this. Uh, that there is a log n scaling, and that, that does turn out to be the case. So we can show the following bounds on uh, how long it takes until everybody receives every packet. So there's a lower bound of log n over p. p is the edge probability in your Edge-Renyi random graph, and this holds for both versions. And for the upper bound, for the version where you only relay things you heard in the first round, we could prove an upper bound of 2 log n over p. And for the other one, the upper bounds we could prove were a bit worse, either 3 log n over p or 2 log n over p squared, whichever is smaller, depending on p. Uh, in, this, in the version b, you are sampling from potentially more packets that have in the later rounds. The, the upper bound comes out to be worse. That doesn't necessarily mean the algorithm is worse. The bounds we can prove are worse. Yeah. OK, and it will be. You'll see very soon why these are the bounds we get. Uh, the lower bound is a coupon collector argument. So, OK, I was going to say it later, but I can say it now. So uh, I have uh, PN neighbors. So in one round, I get PN packets. Uh, these are being somehow randomly sampled. Uh, I need n log n packets in the coupon collector bound to make sure I get all n messages. So the number of, the minimum number of rounds I need to get n log n packets is log n over p, because I get n p messages per round. Okay, so it, I'm not looking at anything more than to say whatever others are giving me is random, and so by the coupon collector argument, I need n log n packets. Yes. Yeah, you, in each round you are getting, because I have NP neighbors, I'm getting NP packets. N, N packets are being transmitted, but I can only hear NP of them. Ah, okay, yeah, okay, so, okay, maybe, okay, this, this, bound is, this bound is wrong. I should add one. There is the first round, and then after the first round, you are getting the randomness. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. The lower bound doesn't work. The, okay, somehow, yeah, I left out the first round in thinking, uh, yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, you have, okay, so you get randomness in the things that you didn't hear, which is, yeah, you're right, maybe we should, okay. I should rethink that. It might be what you didn't hear is n times 1 minus p. And uh, so if you have log of n times 1 minus p, that's the number of coupons you need to collect. And you are getting, uh, OK, so no, maybe I'll have to rethink that from scratch. Yeah, thinking of p fixed and n going to infinity. Um, so, it, and strictly smaller than one, strictly smaller than one. Um, okay, I'll have to rethink that. That's a, that's a good point. But the reasoning behind the lower bound is a coupon collector argument. Uh, okay, so the upper bound is 
uh, one of, okay, the upper bound for the version A and the one half of the upper bound for version B comes from very simply looking at all two hop parts. So now we are in the dense addition E graph, so the diameter is two for P strictly smaller than one. You can get from any node to any other node in two hops. So let's just look at common neighbors of U and V for a fixed U and V. Well, how many nodes are in here? Uh, there's an edge probability P on each side. There are, so there are P squared N nodes here very nearly. It concentrates around P squared N. Uh, and in the first round, all of them get the message from U. And we are simply asking how long does it take for one of them to pick that message and transmit it to V. As soon as one of these broadcasts use message, it has reached V. Uh, okay, so what I just said, there are P squared N nodes here. So, uh, and in version A, in every round, uh, a vertex here picks how many messages is it choosing from? It's choosing from everything it heard in the first round, which is NP packets. So with probability one over NP, it's choosing the message of U to transmit. Whereas in version B, it's potentially choosing from more packets. It might be choosing from all N of them very quickly. And so there's only a one over N chance of picking message. Okay, there's at least a one over N chance, but maybe it gets close to this. Uh, and this is pretty much it. So you have uh, this many nodes. So in any one round, what's the probability that they don't pick the message of you? Uh, and you keep repeating this, how many rounds can you go with never having picked the message of you? Uh, and then, uh, so if you take T to be two log N over P, what you can show is the probability that you never pick the message of you uh, is decaying like this, the probability per round and this many rounds. So it goes like one over N squared. So for a given pair U and V, V receives U's message with prob in this many rounds with probability one minus one over n squared and a union bound says that for all pairs they receive the message. Okay. So that's all. Uh, and this also tells you what goes wrong in version B. So the one over n p here has to be replaced by one over n. So you need t to be larger. And Basically, you have to take two log n over p squared, and the exact same calculation goes through. The two in front of the log n basically comes from taking the union bound over n squared things. That's the idea. Uh, okay, so how about the other bound of three log n? That comes from looking at three-step paths rather than two-step paths. Uh, we thought this might help us get better bounds, unfortunately, it doesn't quite get there. It gets rid of the one over p squared term. Again, in the first step, you get to everybody here. Um, and this set now is of size p times n rather than p squared times n. So this is a bigger set. You have reached all of them. And now if you reach a high proportion of vertices here, the same sort of reasoning as before, we can say that in other two log n over p, you can get to v with probability one over n squared, uh, with, prob with complementary probability one over n squared. But then you have to ask how, how long does it take to get from everybody here to most people here, and that takes another log n over p rounds. I'll, I'll, uh, I won't go in detail. It's, it's quite late in the evening, so uh, the idea is to try and reach a one minus epsilon fraction in the, in the layer of in, uh, neighbors of V. Um, and then it takes this many time slots to reach V. Uh, and in order to uh, reach most of the nodes in that set, you need an additional Okay, one plus epsilon log n over p times lots. The details aren't that important. Uh, that's not hard. And um, 
Okay, so those things prove the results are bounds for the relaying method. The main, the main thing to take away from this is uh, it scales in the number of nodes like log m, and the bounds we proved were between 1 over p times that, which might not be correct, and 2 over p times that roughly. Uh, the simulation results suggest that it's uh, somewhere in between. It's 3 over 2p times log n. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to show you the simulation results. The students sent them to me, but uh, they weren't in a format I could include. So uh, they, are, they are pretty compelling about the log n scaling. So he did simulations for between 30 and 16,000 or something like that. And the log n is uh, scaling is compelling. Whether this dependence on p is, it looks like it's this, but okay, from simulations, it's hard to tell what the dependence is. Um, and the other thing the simulations do tell us, of course, the whole question of whether, how well the study of asymptotics tells us about our original motivating problem is something you could question because we are really interested in fairly small n, somewhere between 20 and 100, let's say, but simulations do show that things work pretty much as the asymptotics tell us in that range. They, they are well within that. Uh, okay. Uh, the, now I'm going to present another algorithm for the same problem, which is to use uh, what's called network coding. Uh, so uh, Piyush already talked about coding, so it's uh, uh, it's just a very similar thing. So in the first time slot, every node broadcasts its own packet. Uh, now everybody has about NP packets. So what you do after the first round is each node broadcasts a sparse linear combination of all the packets it received in the first round. Okay, so here for analysis, we need it to just be the first round maybe also for implementation because you aren't decoding in between. So we, you just take random linear combinations of things you received in the first round and transmit them. Uh, and we are going to assume that you do sparse linear combinations a number of times and just once you do a dense linear combination and I'll make precise what I mean by sparse and dense. Our original idea was you could get away with doing everything sparse, that doesn't work, you do need at least one round of dense. Uh, okay, and for sparse, what we mean is that you are taking a linear combination of n things, so you have n coefficients to choose. You choose about log n of them to be non-zero and set all the rest to be zero. That's sparse, uh, and we do this at random. Uh, and dense means that a constant fraction of the coefficients, the constant could be small, but some constant fraction is non-zero. That's dense. And the results don't depend on the field size, so for concreteness, let's just work with GF2. Uh, okay, and the question is, uh, does this work? So at the end of this algorithm, does ev is everybody able to decode all the messages? And what needs to happen for you to be able to decode? You have sent these rand this random coefficient matrix. Uh, so what you need is for this matrix to be full rank. If it's full rank, you can decode. If not, you cannot. So uh, that's what it boils down to. Uh, and so the motivation for why we have chosen the algorithm the way we have comes from this paper of uh, Bloomer and Karp, and maybe someone can tell me how to pronounce this name, otherwise I'll say Welsh. Okay. Maybe Germany, I don't know. <laughs> Welsl, okay, Welsl, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, so let's start first with a square matrix. So you sample a random n by n matrix uh, from a finite field, uh, where you only have log n non-zero elements in each row, okay, log n in expectation. So you pick non-zero with probability log n over n. If you do this, uh, is you, 
Ideally, we would like the rank to be n, then we could invert it and decode. It turns out it isn't, but, but it's close to n. And how close is it? So if we call the defect how the n minus the rank, what they show is, the de is that the defect is of order one. The probability of having a large defect decays exponentially in the field size. Uh, but you don't get all the way there. Uh, and even if you transmitted additional rows, you would have to go all the way up to log n to get full rank. So we would be back in the same scaling regime as the relaying case. So just using sparse rows doesn't give you a better scaling than random relaying. But if now, if, if you're close to full rank and you start adding additional rows, uh, which are dense, then how many more rows do you have to add to get to full rank? It turns out you don't need to add very many. Each row uh, adds one to the rank with some constant probability where the constant depends on the field size and how dense it is, but it's still bounded away from zero. That's the main thing. So every extra row is with constant probability linearly independent of everything else. And so you're, you are gaining, after a geometric number of steps, you are gaining one in the rank. So that's the idea. Okay, so how, how much is the defect? It's order one per, uh, per matrix, but each node is generating its own matrix. So if you look at the worst case over all n nodes, you have a defect of log n, roughly. The worst case defect is log n. So after the sparse phase, you have uh, a defect of log n. So you need about another log n dense linear equations to get to full rank, but your one extra round actually gives you n linear equations. So that's more than enough to make up the defect. So that's the idea behind the algorithm. Okay, so, uh, so are we done? Well, not quite. The problem is that uh, uh, in the algorithm of Bloomer et al, what uh, their analysis assumes that you are sampling uniformly from all n elements in your coefficient matrix. If you could sample in that way, all the results for the coefficient matrix work. But we can't do that because we can only transmit uh, packets we received in the first round. So somehow the first round has forced us to sample from NP coefficients rather than all N coefficients. Different nodes have different subsets of NP. So overall, it might still work, but we are not exactly in the same setting as them. Uh, so we can't simply use their results with no change. So that's the point. So nodes can only sample from the packets they have received, which are binomial with these coefficients. If we were just sampling one vector, this makes no difference. If we are subsampling a binomial, it's as if we are sampling a binomial from all n with a different sampling probability. But as soon as you have multiple vectors, you're sampling multiple vectors, they, they become potentially, they become correlated and you're not in the same setting. Okay, so potentially is it, it's a problem, but is it really a problem? Uh, yes, it is. It wouldn't be if all we were doing were transmitting a small number of sparse random matrices. If, you, if you're only transmitting log n, uh, coefficients, you can't tell the difference. Uh, okay, you, you need to see about square root 10 coefficients before you see two repeated ones. That's the birthday paradox. So if I'm transmitting much smaller than square root 10, you can't see the difference between am I sampling from n or am I sampling from np? They, they look the same. Uh, but because we also have a dense vector, they indeed don't look the same. These coefficient matrices that we generate are statistically distinguishable from those that the algorithm of Bloomer generates. Uh, okay, so this is one approach we tried which didn't work. So, uh, so we want to 
Uh, so we have two probability measures on coefficient matrices. Think of P as what the algorithm of Plumer generates and Q as what we generate. Uh, and they showed that a bad coefficient matrix is one with, whose rank is insufficient. They showed that this is small. The probability of generating such a matrix is small. And we want to do the same for our measure on these random matrices. Uh, and you can bound Q of A, you, if you can pick some auxiliary set B on which this likelihood ratio is bounded, and that set B is big, so Q of B complement is small, then you can bound QA this way. Uh, and so oh, the reason for picking the set B is you can't hope this likelihood ratio is bounded everywhere, but if it's bounded on a big enough set, you can uh, get an upper bound on the probability you want. Uh, we tried this, it didn't, it, it, it doesn't work straight away, but with a small modification to our algorithm, it could work. Uh, so in theory, it works, but it requires knowledge of the exact value of P. Even a small error gets amplified, and so in any practical sense, this algorithm doesn't work. So, uh, so we wanted to do something else. So we modified, or Mark, uh, the student actually came up with this idea of modifying the algorithm in a different way, which is to partition the nodes into subsets and do a version of their algorithm for each subset and put them together, and that does work. Uh, and okay, so what that, needs is for all these uh, nodes to agree in advance on this partition. Uh, you could say that's not fully decentralized, but I, this, this is not an unreasonable assumption. In, in order to do network coding, you can't do it in complete anonymity. Everybody needs to agree on node identities, for instance, uh, to be able to decode. And if you can agree on the node labels, you can also agree on a partition, and that's not hard to do. Okay, and that was uh, all I had to say. Uh, I think I've finished in half an hour, so uh, some open problems can be, yeah, th there is indeed a gap on the bounds for the random relaying model. Uh, can we even get the version B down to two log N over P, which we believe can be done? We are working on that. There is a gap between the upper and lower bounds, and uh, simulations suggest the true answer is somewhere in between. Whether we can close that gap, I don't know. I think if you want to analyze parts of all lengths in this graph, that's, that's much too complicated. And maybe doing two or three step paths is ab uh, about as far as you can realistically do. So that doesn't seem promising, but that's an open problem. Um, for our application, maybe the dense graph was okay, but uh, in general, you would want to do this for much sparser graphs where you have to go over multiple hops. Uh, the analysis for the relaying algorithm, it we believe can be extended to those settings, maybe not optimally, but with at least picking up the correct scaling uh, for the uh, random coding, it seems much harder. It also needs to be modified. You can't just take linear combinations of nearest neighbors. You have to do more, but you can't decode, so you have to take... The dependence builds up quite quickly, and it's not clear how to do that, but that's an interesting open problem, and same for spatial random.